Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. This is going to be our first guest session for our free web development boot camp. Um, if you're not already, a, so, hey, everybody, we've got lots of lovely people coming in. Hey. Um, and we're going to be going ahead and we're going to be meeting Barb and Zach today. Um, we're able to run this free web development boot camp really because the good people at Class Central said, hey, this is a great idea. Let's go ahead and put this forum together. Let's go ahead and put this program together. Um, and Barb has been a really big fan of the Class Central project for a long time, whereas I'm told Zach is a brand new convert and really excited to join uh, join the team. I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves because they're going to do way, way better justice than I possibly can. Zach, hello. Hi, Jess. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having, having me here today. Really appreciate it. Uh, and Barb, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so excited to share today. <laughs> so what are you all going to be talking to us about today? Well, uh, it's going to be awesome insights from neuroscience about how you can more rapidly transition from beginner to expert. So, oh. in fact, if you want to share our first slide, we can yeah. dive in. All right. I'm going to let you all enjoy this. I'm going to escape and please have the easiest possible session with our beautiful, incredible learners. Okay. And over to you, Zach. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Zach Caceres. I'm a senior software engineer for a company based in Silicon Valley. And I live in Denver, so shout out to any Denverites. Shoot me an email if you, you happen to be in town. Um, really, my journey into uh, programming was really an unlikely one. There was really no indication that I would become a programmer, uh, maybe like many of you. There was nothing that really indicated that I had any special technical ability. As a kid, I liked books and I liked playing classical guitar. I did not start programming at a young age. I'm from a small town in rural Maryland where there's not really a broad range of professions. And I think that I did not meet a single person who knew how to code or built anything with code until I was well into my 20s, into my career. I did not study computer science at university. And honestly, the world of code was to me a kind of mystery and it felt unattainable for a lot of years, a lot longer than it should have really. Building with code was to me for a long time, it was something for the elite. It was the exclusive realm of people who studied CS at Stanford or who were math wizards. Whereas for me, you know, I had left school in ninth grade, which, you know, depending on your view of school, isn't, isn't that good of a look, right? When you're looking to build a career. So I really had this perception that coding was off limits to me well into my career. And as you can see in these photos, I stayed focused almost entirely on people and soft skills in the early part of my career, not technology. That's what I thought that I was good at. And I believed it would be impossible to really change my brain and become technical. So how about you, Barb? Well, so it's it's actually a bit similar for me. Um, I I was this little kid who I I hated math and science. I flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science. Uh, you can see me here in like what is probably the very last cute picture of me holding a lamb. Um, and I I just loved animals and knitting and weaving and all those kinds of things. Um, and I knew because I, I couldn't do anything in math or science that I could never have a technical career, which is, is kind of surprising because I'm speaking with you here today as a distinguished professor of engineering. Um, but I got there through a, a kind of a strange path. I, I, I thought, well, if I can't do anything technical, how about maybe I can learn another language? So uh, I enlisted in the army. That's me looking incredibly nervous about to throw a grenade. And if you knew how clumsy I am, you would know why I look so nervous. But I, I did learn another language. I learned Russian, ended up working out on Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea, I loved 
having new adventures and, and you know, just seeing the world through new per perspectives. So I also ended up in Antarctica at the South Pole Station. Um, that's where I met my husband. So I like to say I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that man. But the, I think the interesting thing is that um, I, I could see that no one was interested in my sole professional expertise, which was the ability to speak Russian. However, they, they were interested in, in other kinds of skills. So I'd made a big mistake by doing what everybody had told me and just following, blindly following my passion. I got really good at something that the world wasn't really interested in. So I decided that since I was supposed to be open to new perspectives and new adventures, why didn't I try a new adventure of the mind? And so I went to the university at age 26 and started with remedial high school algebra and slowly began climbing my way upwards. So um, it was not easy, but uh, as was Zach, if I'd known then what I know now about learning, I could have made it so much easier on, on myself. And that's what we're here to do today is to share with you some of these insights that can make your learning much easier and really to, to help show you that, you know, if you're feeling like an imposter or you're uncomfortable and you can't really learn these new skills, it's really possible. And we'll show you some of the great tools that will help you along those paths. Really the first step into understanding how to transition from someone who maybe has no technical background whatsoever and to become you know, an expert programmer is to start with a few simple principles that help us get on the same page about the nature of programming. The first is that programming is really weird. It is an extremely weird and kind of unnatural behavior. If you think back into human history, if you sat around and you thought about abstract symbols all day, it was a great way to just get selected right out of the gene pool, right? It's not natural to sit in a chair for eight hours and try to figure out where did I forget to put this semicolon or how is this word slightly misspelled and I didn't realize it. Programming also demands a really intense kind of focus. And it's the kind of focus that in the history of humanity was typically only applied in small bursts, you know, adrenaline fueled bursts where you were hunting and running from a predator, fighting, negotiating with rivals, not five days a week, you know, for years on end, right? Which is what employers expect you to do as a programmer these days. Now, even by modern standards, programming is a bit strange. You know, 19th century, 20th century programming was much more physical. It was much more hands-on. The constraints that you were dealing with as an engineer were hard. You know, you're bumping up against the laws of physics. Software systems are very different than uh, engineering physical systems. The constraints are much software, uh, softer rather. So your imagination and the ability to maintain the system are human factors, like where people get confused. These are often the relevant constraints. In fact, some people even argue that software systems are inherently more complex than physical systems because their design can never be visualized in detail in a way that understands all the implications of that system. This makes software very powerful, but also bug prone and confusing. And this huge amount of freedom that you get as a programmer can be very overwhelming. Now, all of this is to say that to thrive in such a unique and a young discipline that has all these unnatural behaviors in it, many default human behaviors may not work well. We shouldn't assume that just because you're doing something by default or it comes natural to you, that it's well adapted to the weird world of software. And what we're going to be talking about today is possibly some unique and even maybe somewhat eccentric behaviors or habits that can help. Now, the second principle to get on the same page here about learning programming is that programming is hard. Okay, this is an image from a popular blog post that's focused on how do you learn front-end web development. If you look at this chart, I actually couldn't even fit the whole chart on, uh, on this slide. I had to slice it in half and then put them side by side. 
in theory, this chart, I think, was supposed to help people feel comfortable navigating their learning path. But I don't know about you, but like just seeing this chart gives me anxiety. Right. And I work with many of these technologies every day. Now, the big reason why programming is hard is because it demands so much learning. Every node in this graph represents another tool or another piece of a web developer's toolkit. And the reality is, is that the pace of change in tech is brutal, which means that these nodes are changing all the time. And as a programmer, you're paid to learn every day, whether that's part of your company system or something new that's showing up in this web of technologies. So what does all of this sum to? First, software is a strange and unnatural behavior that we shouldn't assume we're well suited to if we follow our default behaviors. Two, software demands constant learning and it's, and it's complex. So learning how to learn and learning how the brain actually works for us in how we learn is as relevant for software engineers and probably more relevant for software engineers than many other fields that don't face this fast pace of change or involve such complexity. So let's look at the brain and how we actually learn. So when there's one central idea to how we learn, and that involves the fact that the, that we need to make connections within the brain's uh, long-term memory in the neocortex in order to learn anything. If we have not actually uh, learned or if, we can think we've learned something, but if we have not made connections between neurons in long-term memory, we actually have not learned it. So what do I mean by this? If you take a look here, we've got this neuron, and what is happen happening when you learn something is really quite simple. You're just taking these neurons and you're connecting them sort of through a... Um, uh, a, uh, whoops, this is actually not, it's, it's not progressing properly. Uh, uh, so let's see if I can get this to work here. Come on. Okay. Look at these neurons and you can see how there's sort of an electrical signal that passes along the set of neurons. And that connection via electrical signals is we've created a connection and that is what the pattern of learning actually is. So for example, I'm showing five neurons here that are connected. Actually, it can be thousands, hundreds of thousands with, uh, with even millions of synaptic connections. When you learn something as simple as an algorithm or uh, how to do subtraction or how to take a derivative in math or how to do a dance step, whatever you're learning, you're simply connecting a batch of neurons together. And, and when you are, um, when you practice with what you've learned, what that practice does is it helps to strengthen the connections between those neurons. So it's kind of going like this. You, you get this weak understanding of something you're learning, but the more you practice with it, the stronger and richer those sets of links become. So if you look at this kind of squiggly S-shaped sort of thing, what that is doing, that is sort of within the neocortex, uh, which is the surface of the brain. And it's a really small set of connections. So it's super small. You can see here, it's like too small to see. But what do I mean when I say the neocortex? It's actually simply the surface of the brain. And you can see it kind of popping out and unfolding here. It is, it's about the size of a two foot by two foot dinner napkin, two and a half millimeters thick. That's where you store the great bulk of everything you learn. And it's, uh, you've got 86 billion neurons, each of which can have a thousand or more connections within it. So you can never run out of space for your learning. But, but this, uh, this brings me to the idea that your brain is, is really the most valuable part of your toolkit. Now, there are mountains written 
about how do you learn development? How do you make software development easier? Um, some of these things may be unfamiliar to you if you're early on in your learning journey. If you're a bit further along, you've probably seen some of the words and phrases that are flying around this programmer in this image. Um, there's mountains written about this stuff. There's amazing tools. There's philosophies of software development, project management tools, books and courses. There's a thousand and one various tools and approaches uh, to make development easier. But much of this education is focused on technology itself. You'll hear something like clean code, or how do I test my code, or how do I make a scalable architecture for an application? Companies will train employees in the tools of how to execute their workflows, right? And their companies are quite good at this, but too often missing is that at the center of all of this is a human with a brain. Generally speaking, programmers are not trained explicitly for the thing that really is at the heart of how we program, which is our brain. And but you know, between the problems, the coding problem you're working on and the tools like the code is the human, right? So what we're gonna be doing here today is talking candidly about specific cognitive skills that are focused on how to improve the human with the brain at the middle of the programmer's uh, tool chain here. Things like, for example, focus, time management, how long do you spend on a bug before taking a break, procrastination, how do you learn new technology systematically, anxiety management, the effect of smartphones and social media on programmer productivity, all of these things are very specific skills, and they're a little bit different than soft skills, which you may have heard of, especially if you're, you're getting into this world. People will talk about the importance of soft skills. Soft skills are, for instance, being able to write well or to speak well or to understand the business relevance of something technological. Those are all important skills, but these are really slightly different because they're focused on the cognitive aspect of how we use our brain to be a programmer, to become an expert programmer and to execute our task. So cognitive skills matter because the brain, and this is everyone's brain, has some serious limitations. And so let's talk about some of those limitations, like in particular, what's going on in your brain so that you can next understand what how this applies when you're actually programming. So first we need to understand the two, two different important memory systems of the brain. First is long-term memory. So that's where you're, you're hopefully creating those sets of links when you're learning something. And the second is short-term or working memory. They're, they're very similar in, in, uh, in meaning. And this working memory is in your prefrontal cortex I like to imagine it as an octopus or rather a quadrupus because it it can hold on to, in general, about four pieces of information at once. This means you can present it with an, a piece of information or it can go back in within the brain and haul out a set of links that you've already created in the brain. So, so how do you create those sets of links? We'll, we'll kind of look a little bit, uh, you know, kind of at the surface of, of what's going on. Your working memory is, it kind of is using those, those arms, so to speak, to create sets of links that it stores in long-term memory. And then later, if you've created and practiced with and strengthened those sets of links, your working memory can hold those sets of links out and then you can easily work with it. And I'll give you a specific example. This involves our daughter, Rachel. Um, Rachel is, she's going to model for us what it felt like when she was first learning to back up a car. And watch her little face. She's like, uh, now let's see, uh, do I look in that mirror? No, this mirror, do I look behind me? Do I look in front of me? Would, you know, which way do I go? And then of course, off she goes into the ditch. What was really going on was as Rachel was trying to figure this stuff out, that's when her working memory was um, involved in trying to piece together what the what she was supposed to be doing. She had a heavy cognitive load. Notice all of the arms of her attentional octopus were busy. That meant there's no arms available for anything else. 
So do not try to talk with someone when they're learning to back up a car because they're, they're completely, all of their working memory is, is used up. But once Rachel learned to back up the car, she could, um, she could hold, uh, all she has to do is think, I want to back up a car. And she can call those links to, to mind and she has a light cognitive load. In other words, her, uh, the arms on her attentional octopus are not busy doing something else. She just needed one to, to kind of pull that information to, to mind so she can do more complicated thinking much more easily. This means that let's say you're a programmer. Then when you, when you have certain ideas and certain techniques so well in mind, you've really learned them and created those sets of links in long-term memory. Then when you're created with or faced with a new situation, you can kind of go, oh, look, you know, oh, you know, there's this one thing. If I connect it with this other, then you can put together new ideas and uh, and work with them much more easily if you have those uh, fundamental ideas set in long-term memory in those sets of links. Some people will, they'll look over the materials and they will underline or highlight or watch a video, but they don't actively work with the material themselves. So they're not creating those sets of, of links in, in long-term memory. I mean, it's, it's good to watch a video to get started but you need to practice with it in order to develop those sets of links. And then what happens is they, they can sit down, they try to, uh, to do whatever, but they don't have any links in long-term memory. And so they, they can end up being very frustrated, very confused uh, as a result of this. Um, people, here's the important point. Working memory capacities differ. On average, some people have four, or most people have around four arms on their attentional octopus. But a number of people are like me. They have lesser capacity working memory. So I um, I probably have about three uh, arms on my attentional octopus. I can hold three pieces of information. Other people can hold a lot of information in mind. It's easier to learn faster if you have a higher capacity working memory. But guess what? You can learn more deeply if you have a lower capacity working memory. It's a little bit like this. Some people, they learn very quickly. They've got a high capacity working memory. I call them race car learners. And other people like me are, they're, they're, they're more like hiker learners. They, they, the race car, everything goes by in a blur. The hiker still gets there, but they're looking at the forest. They can hear the birds. They can smell the pine in the air, see the little rabbit trails. A completely different experience and in many ways far richer and deeper. My hero in science is a man named Santiago Ramoni Cajal, total hiker learner. He struggled. He just he thought he was really stupid most of the time. He was kicked out of several schools because he couldn't learn very well at all. And he was also a troublemaker. And finally, at around age 20, he decided to try to see if he could get serious. And he took a test uh, once per year. And on the third year, the last year he could possibly qualify, he passed this test to become a professor of anatomy. So hiker learner becomes a professor of anatomy. Then he won the Nobel Prize for, his learn for, for what he had discovered. Then Ramoni Cajal is now considered the father of modern neuroscience. And he was asked, you know, what's with it? You know, basically you're, you're not that bright a guy. <laughs> and uh, he said, I was no genius. But he, he said, I know many geniuses. What I was, was persistent and flexible. The geniuses I work with, they learn really quickly. They're super fast. They jump to conclusions. And when they're wrong, they cannot 
flexibly change their mind. So if you're no genius, rejoice, because you will sometimes be able to do things that even geniuses cannot. So uh, a key idea for those of you with lesser capacity working memory is the idea of scaffolding. So you can't just jump up to the top. Break your material up into smaller pieces that you internalize. And, you know, piece by piece, you're building those sets of links and gradually putting them together. And that way you can learn the same material. It may take you longer and you may need more practice, but you actually can learn it better. So the key idea for lesser capacity working memory, break what you're learning into smaller chunks and practice with it. So, so as Barb mentioned, people have different working memory capacities. And there is a bit of a perception in the world of uh, software engineering that people with larger working memories have an advantage as a programmer because they can hold more context and more variables in their mind at once, which seems to help with uh, problem solving. But there's a huge number of things that are within a programmer's control to optimize how you use the working memory that you do have. In other words, we can look at ways to economize our working memory, regardless of where you fall on that spectrum of, of octopi there. Now, even people with big working memories, like some engineers that I've worked with in the past, often have habits and behaviors that work against them. For example, when I'm trying to find that one tab with the docs I need. I need to look up this one function and I know it's in the doc somewhere and this is what my browser looks like when I'm trying to find it. Or for example, when I'm trying to find that one error in the console, I'm looking and there, it's, there's an endless kind of spam of random red messages and it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Or maybe when I'm trying to find the one file that I was working on but I have a thousand windows open and I've got 10 files open in every window and there's notifications popping up everywhere on the side of my screen and my cell phone's vibrating on my desk. I often, uh, often when I pair a program, which is a practice where two programmers work together on the same problem, when I pair a program with early career developers, I often find that, that this is what their workspaces look like. They have 50 tabs open, 50 files open, you know, 10 windows open, console spam, you know, they're logging like 100 things with the same message in the, in the terminal. And when I ask them about the problem they're working on, like, hey, so what do you need help with? They'll kind of meander through the files and kind of get lost along the way and sort of like, well, I was going to fix this button on the login screen. And then I realized that the user module needed to change. And then there was this bug in one of the tests. And then like, what were we, what was I fixing again? You know, and they kind of get, they get lost. They get lost as to where their destination was. And then this tends to lead to silly mistakes. For example, I've paired with people, and I have myself made this mistake, where you forget to save the file that you're working on because you're constantly flipping between. And then I go and I look and I say, well, I don't understand. I thought I fixed this, but now it's broken again. Like, what happened? And it's as simple as I didn't even save the file. The other thing that you see is a certain kind of blindness to information. I'll often pair with early career developers who will often have the error directly in front of them on their screen. It will literally tell them what's wrong and how to fix it, but they won't see it. They won't see the answer that's right in front of them because they've saturated themselves with so much noise that what matters has been lost. Now, all of this is to say that being deliberate about how you use your working memory is going to make it easier for you to learn and to program and solve problems once you understand how to code. One of the first things that I do when I or uh, when I pair with someone who's struggling with a problem is to close all the tabs and files and windows and everything that's possibly re that's not related at all to the problem that I'm solving. Now, this, the first thing this does is it focuses us in on, this, on the problem and on the statement of the problem. And it also de-stresses both people because we're not lost in the uh, of random noise. Now, 
as you advance into more advanced levels of programming, you're going to start hearing people talk about, well, what is good programming? What is good software design? I would argue that this idea of working memory based in the neuroscience that, that Barb presented to us, it actually reaches to the heart of software design itself. Now, most of the time, people are not describing good programming in terms of working memory, but a lot of the principles that you read are directly related to this problem of working memory. Now, let's, uh, you don't have to take my word for it. This is a quote from John Osterhout, who is a Stanford CS professor. And he says, the greatest limitation in writing software is our ability to understand the systems we're creating. Complexity accumulates and it becomes harder and harder for programmers to keep all the relevant factors in their mind as they modify the system. This is all about working memory. It's about economizing working memory. We want to free our minds from little things like too many tabs and too many windows and too much noise and nonsense and notifications so that we can focus our mind on the higher level building blocks so that our working memory can, that we do have can focus on problem solving and not all the noise around us. Now, uh, the second cognitive skill that we need to talk about is anxiety management. Now I'm gonna argue that the ability for a programmer to manage their own anxiety is a core software engineering skill. And I recognize that this sounds a bit weird, but let me explain. Anxiety is a part of the problem solving experience. The nature of programming is that you're always going to be encountering, encountering new problems and things that are broken in new ways. And every time you do, this creates some unease in, in you. Now, many have used this reality to point out that programming is about tenacity. You know, it's not even just about, you know, trying to be smart. It's about being tenacious and like sticking with the problem. And to some extent, I agree with this and this is true, but I'd like to think of it more that programming is about the intelligent use of your tenacity. In other words, managing your anxiety by figuring out how much energy and intensity do I put into this thing as much as it is about like blindly being, being tenacious about stuff. Now, it's hard to spend all day with things that are broken in complicated ways. When you learn how to program, everything feels broken because you don't understand what's going on. And there are two big problems that this anxiety created uh, by the process of problem solving, how this anxiety creates problems for software engineers. And the first of these is what I call code frenzy mode. Now, in my first year of programming, I would work myself into this like frenzy of frustration rather than recognizing that my brain was overwhelmed, my working memory was saturated, and I needed to take a break. I had convinced myself that I was giving up or that if I spent just another 10 minutes focusing as hard as I could, then the answer would be obvious. But this was actually delusional. And all it did was make me mad and made me stressed out. And honestly, it probably made it harder for me to solve problems. And for it, it probably took longer to solve those problems than it needed to. Believe it or not, taking a break is part of programmer productivity. Why? Well, it's part of anxiety management, which is a cognitive skill that a successful programmer must have. Now, as Barb will now explain, taking a break is a scientifically valid part of the problem solving process. And so what is taking a break? First, let's talk about what it is not. So when you are focusing on a problem, you're actually activating usually a, a, a more limited area in the brain uh, that's why psychologists will call this the task positive network, that you're activating this task positive network because you're activating like some portion to, that is involved with uh, algorithm analysis or uh, with, with writing something or with, you know, with that particular task. The other mode of thinking is what I call diffuse mode. Psychologists call this the task negative network, whereas neuroscientists call this the default mode network. But whatever you call them, there's two completely different networks in the brain. Now, to better understand these two networks, we're going to just take a quick use of, an, of a metaphor. And the metaphor 
that we'll use is that of a pinball machine. So if you're my age, which you probably are not, you remember pinball machines, but if you are not my age, all you have to do to play pinball is to pull back on a plunger and this ball goes bouncing around on these rubber bumpers and that's how you get points. So what we're going to do is we are going to take this pinball machine and we're going to insert it directly on the human brain. So here we go. There is the pinball machine on the brain. And this is our analogy for the focused mode of thinking. In this mode of thinking, you have patterns laid, connections between neurons by virtue of the fact that you've already learned that material. So, uh, so let's say it's multiplication. You think, if I asked you to multiply 22 times 71, you might pull, pull out a sheet of paper or something, and then, uh, or, or even work it in your own mind, and you, your thoughts follow along this pattern that has been laid by virtue of the fact that you've already learned how to do multiplication. But let's say, that you're learning something completely new. So we might imagine it as you're, you're going to learn division. So here's division. This is where it's going to be. But this is way more comfortable. You've already got those multiplication patterns laid in your brain. So you, what, when you're trying to learn how to do division or that new set of algorithms that you're supposed to be working with, your mind can slither back into the much more comfortable patterns that you are already familiar with. The result, you can't figure out the problem. In fact, you can be looking at the, the errors and you can't see it because you're thinking in the wrong way. You're not really looking at what needs to be seen. So what what happens a lot of times is you'll be looking, 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 trying to find that error or trying to understand a new concept or figure out a problem. And finally, your thoughts keep slithering on the wrong thought patterns. You give up. You shut the book. You turn off the monitor. You go for a walk. You do something and you get your mind completely off of what is frustrating you. And that opens up this other mode of thinking, the diffuse mode, what I call the diffuse mode. Notice how far apart these, these rubber bumpers are in this mode. When you think a thought, those thoughts range much more widely. You can't think in the careful, focused way that you can when you're in the focused mode, but you can at least get to that new perspective you need to refresh yourself so that you can tackle that problem with fresh eyes. You can, when, you're, when you're trying to figure anything out, anything that's difficult, uh, or understand a new concept, you're going back and forth frequently between focused and diffuse modes. You cannot be in both modes at the same time unless you're taking certain forms of mushrooms, and we are not advocating <laughs> that here. Um, so, so, so these are ideas I think that can be very helpful for you. It is sometimes okay to take a break, get your mind off it, do something else, because that can bring you back with fresh eyes, unless, unless you do something else. So the second way that anxiety can really hurt software engineers is procrastination. To put it bluntly, procrastination can totally screw up your career and it's intimately related to anxiety and anxiety management. You do not want to become the engineer with the reputation for procrastinating your work because really truly your colleagues won't trust you, you won't get promoted, you won't be put on the most interesting things. You know, they may keep you around because you'll sometimes ship code but it's a bad look and if it's a habit of yours, it's good to just face it head on. Now, I find that almost everyone tenses up when I start to talk about procrastination because it affects basically nearly all of us, you know, including me. Like everyone feels embarrassed about procrastination. But we, if we talk about it objectively, 
we can see where it fits in to the programmer's problem solving process and figure out how it can be overcome with science. So as we've seen, you can essentially manufacture problem solving through the use of the focus mode and the diffuse mode. In the case of programming, this is basically focusing intensely on the problem you're trying to solve, you know, loading all the variables into your head of what's going on and then relaxing, not thinking about it for a little while. But the only way that this switching between the focus and diffuse mode works is if you actually do the focus part, right? You have to stick with the problem long enough to get it in your head, uh, but not so long that you drive yourself into this, you know, frenzy of frustration, right? Now, being in the focus mode means being truly, totally focused on the problem when you're in that mode. Otherwise, you're not equipping your brain to deliver the insight that you need. You're not loading in all the relevant variables. So what stands in the way of programmers and their use of the focus mode? The answer is anxiety and procrastination. When people turn their attention to a bug or a feature or some task or learning a new concept or whatever that stresses them out, People will instead pick up their phone, idly check email, go on social media, or basically anything more pleasant than the task at hand. And if a bug is difficult enough, basically anything is more pleasant than the thing you have to face. Now, the digital age has made distraction especially challenging. First is, you know, larger tech companies are, you know, they make money based on having your attention. So they're optimizing the experience that once you get in their platform, that you want to stay in their platform. They're trying to give you the best experience that they can, but one effect of that is capturing a lot about your attention, right? Now, lesser understood about this, though, is that there is a social element in particular that makes a text message, an email, or a social media notification an especially potent distractor. When you see a notification or that you received a text message or that you have a Twitter DM waiting or whatever, it carries with it an implicit social expectation. And that expectation is to respond. Now, if you recall the, the hunter gatherers, the kind of uh, prehistoric man that we talked about in the first slide, humans are social creatures. That's what we evolved to be. We did not evolve to coldly ignore everyone around us. I think a great way to think about this and to, to really feel that social expectation that's built into notifications is to think about back, back in the old world when we all worked in offices uh, and you sat in an open office plan, when someone would come up to your desk while you're focusing. Someone might come up to your desk, they might say nothing, they might not touch you, they might not do anything. But it is so hard to truly ignore that person once you know that they're there and they have that expectation of your attention. This is the reason that a lot of software engineers hate the open office plan and they're often complaining about like being stuck in a place where everyone can bother them. But the great irony is just like in this image, okay, software engineers will import the most destructive aspect of the open office plan into their workflows by allowing digital distraction all around them while they work, okay? Every notification, every email, every text message, every vibration creates a little background process in your mind. It creates a social expectation to respond. And that's this open loop in your mind that consumes a little bit of mental RAM. Now, if we look at uh, this person here, this would be an example of someone who may be engineered in a previous time, right? Or even today, if you're in a more mechanical engineering kind of uh, work environment, it's very hard to use a lathe or, you know, cut wood and also tweet at the same time. You can't really halfway it, right? And programmers, I think, don't have the benefit of the kind of focused workflow that the guy in that image had, right? We live in the browser. We live in the same realm of digital distraction for our work, that we live in when we entertain ourselves. I mean, if you're a web developer, for example, you stare at the browser all day, which is exactly the same UI that you use to watch Netflix or you know play video games or chat on Twitter or whatever it is that you're that you're going to do, right? And of course, companies don't often help because they want their programmers always available in Slack or for like a quick Zoom check-in or, or whatever. The point of all this is that focused programming, going into that focused mode, is really easy to fake as a software engineer. We're all guilty of this, 
and you know you have your files open on the computer but also like facebook is open in another tab or like your phone's right there on top you know above your keyboard you know vibrating every so often and the reality is is that the mere presence of a potential distractor is a really bad idea and you don't have to take my word for it because to understand the power of these digital distractors and its effect on programmer productivity we can look exactly at how procrastination happens in the brain. So it turns out that if you even just think about something you don't like or don't want to do, it activates a part of the brain, the insular cortex that experiences pain. This, this gives you this kind of unhappy feeling. And so the, what you often do is you turn your attention to something more pleasant. And the result, of course, is that you feel happier temporarily. Now, so the, the main idea for tackling procrastination, I'm an engineer now, so let's just get to what practically can you do to intervene when you need to, to get away from procrastination. And the best way to do it is to use what's called the Pomodoro technique. Those of you who might know this technique already, uh, great. Those of you who don't, um, the course I teach, um, Learning How to Learn on Coursera, has well over 3 million registered students. And uh, to practically to a student, they all rave about the value that the Pomodoro technique has brought into their lives. And this technique was invented by an Italian, Francesco Cirillo, in the 1980s. It's a wonderful technique because it is so simple, yet it aligns with everything what, from what we know of uh, from neuroscience about how we can focus effectively. So the first thing, you turn off all distractions. So close those browsers, uh, no pop-ups on your computer, no text messages. If you have a two-year-old at home, good luck with that. But uh, you, in most circumstances, you can reduce or drastically minimize the, the distractions that you have. If you have um, problems with uh, leaning towards attentional difficulties, it is all the more important for you to turn off distractions because what distractions do, remember that, that diffuse mode? If you have attentional difficulties, that diffuse mode loves to pop into place. Slightest little distraction, it will pop up and you find yourself kind of going off and doing something different. So minimize these distractions, then set a timer, any timer for 25 minutes. I have a little timer on my laptop that I like to use. I actually have a real live uh, Francesco Cirillo um, Pomodoro uh, that I, I also use sometimes. I should get it out here. It's really cute. Um, and then you focus as intently as you can for 25 minutes. If you're like me, what I will do is I, I find myself messing around. So I set a timer to do the Pomodoro and I, I, I focus so hard. You would be so proud of me. Sweat pours off my brow. I have been working so hard. And I look up at the timer because I know I'm almost done. And I've just done three minutes of the Pomodoro. And my mind screams, I cannot do another 22 minutes. So what I do is I let that thought go right on by and I return my attention to whatever I'm working on. Because the reality is we can all do 25 minutes. And actually, Pomodoro helps train you so that you aren't always just like being scatterbrained and going off here and there. And every time you are, like going off here or there, you're actually pulling out your the, the neural connections you've made, implanting new ones. Then you're trying to get back into the ones you were accessing before. It is really um, very uh, mentally exhausting. And so this is another reason why this, you know, just a nice period of, of concentration followed by the most important part of the Pomodoro which is a reward at the end. So if you have, a, um, optimally, you will do something that does not involve focus. Have a, cup of, uh, have a cup of tea, walk around a little bit, 
you know, listen to some music, something like that. But if you go and look at your cell phone, you're going to be like, I'm just going to take a glance. Let's see if I got a text message. Oh, I did. Oh, wait a minute. I better respond. As soon as you do that, you're back in focus mode. And there are all sorts of things going on in your brain when you are mentally relaxing that help you to grapple unconsciously with whatever you're working on if you actually let your brain relax as opposed to if you go back into focus mode. So you really want to reward yourself, but with something that's mentally relaxing. So, uh, but, but this is what can happen in real life. I think click this. If could you click the slide bar so that they get full play? There we go. Thank you. So, um, what can we do actually concretely to fight distraction as a programmer? Um, the first is remarkably simple, which is just to hide your cell phone for the reasons that Barb just explained. The presence of the phone, at least modern smartphones. If you have some some ancient phone, you know you might be safe, but. Modern smartphones, if you even see them, will beckon you to their use. And this is uh, how the diffuse mode kind of bubbles up all of a sudden and drags you away from what it is that you're focused on. The key is to not just say, put it down on your desk, but to not put it nearby and to not have it even in eyesight. Some people have resorted to radical solutions like putting their phone into timed kitchen containers that lock and only open after a set period, like say an hour or 25 minutes, a Pomodoro length or something like that. Um, I think it's pretty, th this is an image from Amazon and I think it's pretty revealing that this retailer shows the cell phone next to M&Ms and it could kind of, I think it can indicate to you how healthy it actually is to keep your smartphone close by while, while you're working. Now, there are also software-oriented approaches that can really help a programmer get a handle on procrastination. Um, one is to, let's say you, for some reason, really cannot hide your phone, like you need to be, someone needs to be able to uh, get in contact with you. Uh, one thing is to put it on Do Not Disturb. Um, I've had my phone on Do Not Disturb continuously for, um, more or less continuously for several years. The only, a very small number of people, basically like loved ones can contact me. And then a system called PagerDuty, which uh, will call me when our pr production systems crash. These are the only people that can call me directly. Otherwise I can encounter notifications or phone calls or text messages on my own terms, but I don't see them, see them on my phone until I'm ready. Um, Freedom is a software suite that brings the same kind of logic to the desktop, you know, to, to your laptop, right? Uh, essentially, freedom lets you configure certain times of day or blocks of time where you block a certain subset of applications or websites or whatever it is that you want to block. It works wonderfully well. And just taking certain options off the table is a great way to free your mind to focus. There's also a program called Rescue Time. Rescue Time monitors your time on the computer and gives you really detailed uh, quantitative data on how you're spending your time on your computer. I guess... Um, Mac now has something similar built in, but I still use rescue time. The first time that I used it, it was incredibly sobering to see how much time I was wasting. It was honestly kind of brutal to face, but it was like the first path was <laughs> the first step on the path was acceptance, recognizing that and accepting where I was and how to get my time under control. Now, last I'll mention a Pomodoro app like Forest which is an app that gamifies the process of doing Pomodoros, where you kind of grow trees and slowly plant a forest over time as you successfully complete these Pomodoros. So I think it's time for us to switch gears just a little bit and talk about the some concrete things you can do during learning to help make your learning, um, expedite your learning and, and make best use of whatever you've learned as you're programming. And a person who can help us understand this is uh, my favorite athlete of all times. Uh, that's Julius Yego. And Julius is from Kenya. Um, Kenya is well known for their long distance runners. If you look at Julius's arms, they are not those of a long distance runner. And in fact, Julius always wanted to learn to throw the javelin. He, he was, 
he couldn't afford though to um, to go overseas and study um, throwing the javelin, and there were no good coaches in Kenya. So what he resorted to doing was he began watching outstanding javelin throwing coaches on YouTube, and then he would go out and he would practice. So he'd watch a coach, practice, watch, practice. And do you know that 98% of the time, simply by doing that, he became the world champion in throwing the javelin. So, I mean, that tells us a, a number of different things, but a big one is that you can learn practically anything online if you have good teachers to help you. Um, and uh, it does make me laugh because sometimes people will be like, can't learn very well online. It's just, you got to be face to face. And then you say, well, could you learn a sport on time, uh, online? Could you become a world champion? They're like, no, of course not. You can't learn sports online. And then if you present this example, the next thing they'll say is, well, maybe you can learn a sport, but not something mental. It's actually easier to learn something mental from good teachers online. So, um, so if, if you're learning coding online, actually that's really one of the best ways to go for it so so oftentimes when people are learning things um you know like right now we are forced to give you all of our information in kind of one big data dump because if we took the time out to practice with you now this session would have to be half a day or more at least this way, hopefully you might have a recording or Dwell has made a, a recording. So, um, and of course we're glad to share our slides, but what you, what you want to be doing is practicing with some of the ideas that we are sharing here. So, but in any case, usually a, a for, for hundreds of years, uh, it's been considered that, you know, the only way to teach is lecture. Uh, and simply because you get all the students together and, you know, you want to share as much as you can. But then academic experts in education came and said, no, 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 lecture is not the way to learn. You need to be working actively with the material. So, uh, so what their thought was is you have to have active learning. Two hours should be two hours of active learning. Well, uh, you know what? Y you kind of got to get a little instruction in what you're doing. You, you need to have some kind of uh, explanation and active session. So whether it's explanation and active session where it's big or uh, a lecture that's, you know, I don't know, kind of mixed, um, this mixture of an explanation with active practice is a very old technique. Um, Siegfried Engelman uh, worked with it and developed it in the 1960s called direct instruction. And it's sort of common sense. You should get some explanation and then you should practice with what you've learned. And this is actually a really good way to learn. So um, in fact, this is what Julius Yeager was doing. He was he was getting some active instruction, and then he was uh, actually just going out and practicing with what he was learning. So, uh, so explanation, practice, explanation, practice, and that's how he learned so effectively. So, so, but we can understand what's going on even more deeply if we apply these ideas to what's going on in the brain, because then it will help you to see what you need to do, particularly in your practice, to help you learn more effectively. So I, I talked earlier about how important it was to establish or, or insert sets of links in long-term memory. What I didn't say was there's two ways of doing this. So for example, um, working memory, can put information that you are learning right now through the hippocampus into long-term memory. This is called the declarative pathway. It's for stuff that people can explain. 
like I am explaining this information to you step by step. But there's another pathway altogether, and that is the procedural pathway through the basal ganglia. This is where you deposit sets of links when you're practicing. So you learn theory uh, or some ideas related to programming, but when you practice programming and debugging and everything you need, all of these skills uh, to become a good coder, you are depositing sets of links through that procedural set of uh, system. So you need both types of sets of links in order to be a good, uh, an expert at anything, especially things like programming. So uh, what procedural links do is they help you be really quick and intuitive in what you're doing. Declarative sets of links help you be more um, flexible and, uh, and consciously aware of what you're doing. So you can see you need both types of, of um, approaches in order to know something well. Declarative, you're conscious. You're conscious of me speaking with you. You're not conscious of what you're learning procedurally. It's actually this really interesting black box. You can tell it, figure out this problem. Oh, I figured it out. And you may not know how you learned uh, to figure something out, um, like uh, how to hit a ball, for example, or ride a bicycle. You can't really, you're not really conscious of all the different things that are going on as you're learning those kinds of things. So explicit instruction, like what I'm giving here now, is declarative. You're depositing declarative sets of links, whereas procedural develops through practice. You can explain just as I'm explaining to you now what you learned declaratively. Procedural learning, ah, it's harder. That's why and it, a really good programmer seems to have this intuition and sometimes they can't explain that intuition. Uh, but it also, like, how do you solve a Ru Rubik's cube? You learn that through the procedural system. How do you tie your shoes? You learn it through the procedural system. Good luck trying to explain sequentially to a person how you tie your shoes. So um, a declarative obviously is sequential. Procedural is, it's like, um, it, it's doing many things at once. So it involves complex patterns or you've done so many different slightly varying versions of this that so you can pick up intuitively when something is not uh, it is part of a pro uh, pattern or it's not. So declarative, you're, you can learn it quickly, um, but it can, it's very slow to think through logically what things mean. Whereas procedural, for example, learning to type on the keyboard, it's really slow to learn. But once you learn it, it's really fast to use. Declarative, flexible, but procedural is inflexible. Let's say my husband went in, imp as he is, and he mis mischievously reprogrammed my keyboard. I would find it very difficult to reprogram my own procedural learning so that I could type with this new keyboard. So these are very different types of learning, but both types are really important in allowing you to become an expert programmer. So now it's back to Zach. So as Barb pointed out, both systems matter a lot for success as a programmer. But I would argue that uh, generally speaking, the procedural system gets short shrift in a lot of uh, conversations about how to become a, a developer. Um, Procedural fluency describes when you've become extremely fluent at something that it's essentially in muscle memory. And a procedural fluency is part of becoming an expert programmer and it can support a developer's workflow. Now, one area where it can support the developer's workflow is procedural fluency in the tools that we use, specifically things like hotkeys, shortcuts, and accessory tools like a Bash or the terminal you often hear it referred to as. Now, um, 
someone once told me that when I was learning to program that uh, shortcuts were for people who wanted to be an alpha geek. The ideas, you know, they didn't mean it as a compliment. They meant that it was kind of a waste of time and using a lot of hotkeys and shortcuts and for navigating around and all that uh, wasn't really worth it. And that this was, you know, going and investing these thing, in, in these things was a way of just being like a super nerd who obsesses about really low level or arcane stuff. And like the harder and more obscure the tool is, the cooler it is, you know, all of this. So that's very much not what I'm saying. You know, messing around with tools forever is not worth it. And it can be a way to procrastinate, right? But that's not what I mean. I think uh, early stage programmers discount the value of a certain just simple set of hot keys, shortcuts and tools like the terminal. When I pair programmed for the first time with a really experienced engineer at my first job, one of the first things that stuck out to me was how fast they were. They just like typed fast, they navigated fast, and ultimately they solved problems fast. They knew all these like magical shortcuts that just wrangled code in every direction with such extreme efficiency. This is what procedural fluency in tooling looks like. You know how to move around, you know how to find things, you know how to get things done. And again, it's so that your mind is free to focus on solving the problems. So what can an early career developer do to move towards procedural fluency and tooling? There are two areas for investment. The first is the code editor, where you write your code. And the second is the terminal, which is where you run your code. First, we'll look at the code editor. Um, if you use your code editor and you don't know how to jump to the definition of something, rename a symbol, which means rename something that appears one place everywhere that it appears. Jump between lines and words with one key press, delete a line, you know, find and replace. These, the basic things that I'm listing here on this screen, you are really missing out. There's not a lot here. Every code editor is going to have some way to do this. The hotkey might be different. What this means is just learning these few basic kinds of ways of navigating helps you avoid fussing with files and navigation and keeps you in the flow of problem solving. Now, um, the second place that we can look at is the terminal. The terminal is super intimidating. I was really intimidated by it at first. Um, and it's a very powerful tool. I think it's intimidating basically because Hollywood movies, you know, put up the terminal and like the, the genius hackers like breaking into the mainframe or whatever, you know, th this is, so it creates this idea that it's this like very uh, difficult to deal with kind of, kind of terminal. It's very text heavy, right? But you don't need to be a terminal wizard to massively improve your workflow. A very small investment in a few tools will, um, will really help you out. So uh, I'm gonna explain some of what these things are here and then sort of why they're on this list. So grep and ack are terminal commands for searching through files. Curl is the tool for fetching things over the internet, like fetching a website. LS is listing files. Tree shows you a big list of files. Um, there's a couple tools in here for like manipulating files, uh, like removing them or copying them or you know deleting them, whatever. Um, Again, this is a small list, it's opinionated, people might disagree with some of these things, but truly, if you knew the commands that are on this list, of, and there's not that many and they're not that hard to use, you would go a super long way to becoming fluent in, in the terminal. Now, why make this investment? Okay, again, it all boils down to working memory and then also the procedural system. The terminal takes complex actions and behaviors like moving around a file or requesting a website, and it compresses it down to a simple single keystroke. Again, if you think about the procedural system, what we're doing is we're taking something that actually there's a lot going on when you fetch a website over the internet. But if I type curlgoogle.com, I compress all of that into one simple set of keyboard strokes. So why might we want to compress these complex behaviors into a few simple keyboard strokes? Because ultimately programmers are typists, okay? So the reality is, is that the way in which we get code down on the page is by typing. So another powerful investment you can make in your procedural fluency is typing speed. It's a bit of a stereotype, but it's kind of true that like often very good programmers type really fast.
Now, this isn't necess- this isn't a necessity, okay? And you could imagine, for instance, someone with a disability who may not be able to do this. But fast typing kind of becomes a shorthand for a person with a high degree of procedural fluency, someone who has a lot in their muscle memory, and so they're able to express it quickly. When you're problem solving, you don't want typing speed to be the bottleneck on, on, on what you're doing, okay? The good news is there's tons of typing tutors available. There's even typing tutors that focus on the weird keys that programmers use more often than, than typical people use a laptop. Now, the screenshot at the center of this screen is the keyboard configuration menu for, um, for Mac, for OS X. One of the easiest things you can do to make an investment in your, in your procedural fluency in typing is to just amp up all these settings all the way to the right here as they are in the image. They'll immediately make your keyboard much faster and more responsive and get you on the road to uh, procedural fluency as a typist. Now, there's another form of procedural fluency, which I think is, is also incorrectly uh, downplayed by many early stage developers. How many times have you heard the phrase, I can just look it up in reference to programming languages or concepts? Now, many people say this about uh, you know, tools and your programming language, but it's not really true. Okay, yes, for really obscure things, you'll have to look it up, okay? And you know, not a week will go by where you look up zero things. But there's a certain baseline of language understanding that you need and that's really required for any competent performance as a problem solver. The concepts that you're using as a programmer are effectively the nouns and verbs and grammatical structures of a language. For example, if I told you, I speak French, but I have to look up every word in the dictionary, and then I have to look up in a reference book how to compose those words into a coherent language, I don't think you would really believe me that I spoke French. I wouldn't really speak French. This is just as true as it is for Java or JavaScript or Go or whatever as it is for French or Mandarin. One compelling way to think about this is to imagine you're punctuating a sentence while you're writing. Do you really want to be thinking, I just finished my thoughts, so now I need to put a period and then the next letter needs to be capitalized? No, you don't, because it would really slow down your ability to write to a crawl. You couldn't focus on the ideas because you would be so focused on the nouns and the verbs and the grammar. Now, doing your daily work with the principle, I can just look it up, is a bad idea. The reason it's a bad idea is because you're not taking advantage of the procedural system. If a verb or a noun or a grammatical structure is not in your long-term storage, not in your procedural system, it's not going to be available when you're problem solving. And when you spend time with a great programmer that's that's solving a problem, you'll see that oftentimes they will actually produce multiple solutions to the problem because they have such a deep understanding and procedural fluency in the syntax that they're not hung up on it. They can see many roads to the solution. And that only comes if you have procedural fluency in the language. How do we actually do this? Through memorization. Memorization is not that uh, it's not that sexy, um, and people will you know put it off and say like it's a waste of time. But on the previous slide is actually a list of things that I would argue that are worth memorizing. They're language agnostic. Again, this is an opinion; some will disagree, but you really can't go wrong with memorizing the things on this list. Know how to evaluate the Boolean values, which are the true/false values in programming. Know how to declare a function know how to declare a module, know how to write a loop, don't have to look that up because you're going to be free your mind to really be able to deal with the stuff that matters and has value. Um, And uh, uh, with that, uh, we can focus on how it is that we can actually memorize things most effectively. And that is uh, a question that I will pose for you. So I'm going to give you four techniques for how do you internalize, really get something inside your long-term memory? Is it rereading it? Um, Because you're repeating, highlighting or underlining because you have this motor movement that's reinforcing what what you're trying to learn. Retrieval practice or recall, which is like using a flashcard or something to, to check whether it's in your memory. Or is it something called a concept map where you are sort of uh, 
trying to figure out the key ideas and how they relate to one another. So hopefully you can look at these four and zero in mentally on which one you think is the most helpful. I know for me, I my university career was often spent with rereading and highlighting, but it turns out, even though all the researchers always say it's concept mapping, none of those holds a candle to retrieval practice. Why, what is retrieval practice? It is like when I first explain something here to you, you get this very weak set of neural links. But every time you try to pull it from your own mind, so you've got this you know, weak initial learning, and then you pull it from your own mind, what is happening is you retrieve, you retrieve, you retrieve, and it strengthens those sets of links in long-term memory. So it is retrieval practice. So what you want to be doing is like whatever you're trying to get really fast at, you know, make a flashcard. Uh, try to and see if you can pull it from your own mind. Uh, and this will actually build and strengthen those sets of links like nothing else is able to do. In fact, there was a um, this initial research was published in science. Uh, and it was because everybody took for granted that uh, the other techniques were far more effective. But this, uh, this phenomenal research showed that retrieval practice is far more effective. You might say, well, yeah, it's just helping you memorize things. Not true at all. It turns out that retrieval practice helps you also to understand what you're remembering. Poets will often say, Memorize the poem and you will understand it more deeply. Why should we let the poets have all the fun? It's, it, this, it's this retrieval practice that really can help build your, your understanding. And indeed, in the research, they found that several weeks later, when they tested people who had used retrieval practice, they understood the material far, far better. Let's say you're learning, uh, you know, you're, you're programming, and so you, but you're busy for a couple of days. So you haven't, you're not able to look at what's going on. If you're not kind of bringing those ideas back to mind, your little synaptic janitors will just sweep those synaptic connections away because they're not being used. In fact, we can see exactly what's happening in, happening in a real living neuron. This is a dendrite, one of those legs with dendritic spines on it. This is an image of a living neuron before learning and before sleep. And this is after learning and after sleep, the same living neuron. Look at this new dendritic spine that has emerged during sleep because it's sleep that also helps you practice. Like if you, right before you go to sleep at night, so study during the day, but then, you know, and get it all in, in your mind as much as you can. But right before you go to sleep, tell, just, re, you know, try to retrieve and bring to mind exactly what you want your brain to be practicing with. And, and then what that does is it signals your brain, oh, that's what, you know, what's a really important. And it will go and practice and, and send electrical signals hundreds of times over those neural connections. And it is sleep where those connections really get strengthened. So uh, so this too is why spaced repetition is so important. Over, If you have five hours to study, do one hour per day over five days, not five hours crammed in one day. Because that way of learning, your little synaptic janitor can much more easily sweep away the connections. If you are instead practicing and then sleeping at night, it's like a double hit on them. And, and it really strengthens those connections so that you've got them solidly built in. Another metaphor for the same idea is simply building a brick wall. Before you go too high, you let that mortar dry. So you, it takes time to build a wall. And that is, um, it's kind of, if you don't take that time, you're, you're,
brick wall is going to be a very, very poor foundation for learning. Now, so we've talked about retrieval practice, and we, we've talked about uh, spaced repetition. So remember, we're trying to develop both declarative and procedural sets of links. So what techniques can you use to help you with one as opposed to another type of sets of links? Retrieval practice will help you with both types of links. Spaced repetition helps you with both types of links. Hearing explanations will help you with declarative learning, but varied practice with lots of different problems and interleaving will help you with procedural learning. So what is interleaving? It means having different, slightly different techniques and mixing them up. So I'll speak now in terms of uh, like, let's say you're learning probability distributions. You might have, you do like a bunch of negative binomial problems, then binomial problems, then geometric problems. And you think after you've done 10 of each type of problems that you really understand how to do that technique. You do not, because what you don't understand is what's the difference between binomial problems and negative binomial problems. You haven't practiced that. You haven't looked at it that way. You just know that if you are given a binomial problem, you know how to solve it. But you don't know whether you should use the binomial or the negative binomial technique. So your best bet is don't block it, like block what you're learning, whatever you're learning. Instead, mix things up. Once you've got that key idea with a you know, a couple of times practicing, start interleaving it with closely related ideas that you might mix things up with. In language learning, this might involve um, mixing up present and past and uh, future tenses. And, you know, it's, if you're learning art, uh, you would mix up cubism, uh, modernism, postmodernism. Mix up whatever you're learning. And this kind of approach can be invaluable. So I saw in the chat there are some Anki fans uh, in, in the house, and uh, I too am a, a fan of Anki. Um, there are fabulous decks of programming flashcards all over the internet for basically every, every language you could imagine. And there's simple ones and really complex ones, and there's one for software architecture and all kinds of stuff. And they're usually free or you know open source. Really take advantage of, of these decks. Um, I certainly loved practicing with flashcards, and I do believe it helped me a lot when I was first learning, uh, you know, my first programming language. It is there's just simply uh, no way to beat the power of spaced repetition and retrieval practice, as Barb has described. And programs like Anki or Quizlet, these pl these programs will often have a spaced repetition algorithm built in, so they can help guide you when you need to um, when you need to review. Now, um, as you ascend to higher levels of programming expertise, you start to encounter more and more abstract things. You start dealing with problems that are more abstract or design issues, or you may be refactoring the code, which just refers to not changing the functionality of a code, but changing how the code is organized so that it's, um, it's nicer to, to interact with. Now, the reality is, is that expertise ultimately in programming at these high levels of abstraction, it is not possible if you don't have mastery over the concrete. Procedural fluency in tools, in your language, in these concepts, they, it offloads cognitive load onto your muscle memory, onto the procedural system. And that mastery through procedure leaves more resources for thinking because of what you're not thinking about. You're not thinking about what's that hotkey again? What's that array operator again? How do I write a loop again? How do I make a function again? How do I get a web page in my terminal again? In this way, programming is a procedural craft and long-term success depends on training your procedural system to hold a tremendous understanding of these lower level complexities in the system and the technologies that animate it. Everything so far we've discussed, the hotkeys, the memorization with flashcards, the use of the terminal, moving between the focused and diffuse modes, all of it is there to drive deep understanding into that procedural system in your brain. 
Now, the other reality is that as you get deeper into the industry, you will discover that procedural fluency is rewarded in the industry. Companies want programmers that solve problems and ship code. They don't want talkers, who you know, people who can only have a sort of conceptual conversation about technology. They need people who can get the job done. And again, this takes us right back to training that procedural system so that the, the tools that you need to accomplish your task are at your fingertips. Now, um, I think the mark of true expertise is something Barb mentioned earlier, which is what we might think of as programmer intuition. When you, when you uh, work with great, really great programmers, they have both excellent declarative and excellent procedural systems. They're often able to explain something to you conceptually in a great way, but beneath all that conceptual understanding absolutely is a deeply informed and disciplined understanding of the procedures, right? The hotkeys, the tools, the way things work, the, the way that a program executes in this context, the, the training that procedural system, it trains you subconsciously. And, you know, some really amazing programmers, they can look at an error or even just hear someone vaguely describe a problem and they'll instantly know where to look or even what the solution is to the exact problem. Now, this is not magic and, you know, it, it does take time, okay? But ultimately, with that investment in procedural learning, you can grow the intuition about where a problem is coming from without even seeing it maybe other than, than the error hearing someone tell you. This comes through a long period of pattern recognition where so many things are deep in your intuition that you are able to go and intuit solutions to problems and risks and the kinds of higher level challenges that come in your career. Now, in the end of the, at the end of the day, a serious commitment to the kind of cognitive skills that we've shared today, dealing with anxiety, focus mode, and diffuse mode, investing in procedural learning, interleaving and space repetition and retrieval practice, this, a serious commitment to this will truly take you a long way uh, towards your goal and will train you in the mark of that procedural expertise. Now, let's just revisit briefly the athlete that Barb mentioned, Julius Yego. Now, I think Julius Yego can really serve as an inspiration to us all because his story is so unlikely. He is a person who did not start with everything in his favor, but he found a very smart way to structure his learning to achieve world-class expertise. Programming is like javelin throwing in that it takes practice it is possible for you to become an expert even if you do not have a CS degree, even if you don't have an amazing computer, even if you feel frustrated all the time and feel like debugging is crushing your soul. But you can do this by investing in these specific and concrete cognitive skills to retrain your brain. Manage your working memory. Be nice to your working memory. Use the focus and diffuse mode. Avoid digital distraction. Use space repetition and retrieval practice and invest in that procedural fluency. And the both of us really wish you all the best of luck on your coding journey. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you both. That was incredibly helpful. Um, if you all have just a moment, I really appreciate both your time and expertise. Um, I'd love if we can take a couple of questions from our learners to see if they've got, because I've seen a couple like one person saying, oh, what can I use to, to track Pomodoros? But you all have answered that. So let's see if there's anything else really exciting that, that we can get answered for you. Yeah, all of you beautiful people out there. What would you like to ask Zach and Barb? I mean, I'd Jillian like to ask them. Jillian um, like, missed you. Duh. What? <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. So far, we've just got a lot of people, and I respect this, just wanting to say a lot of real. <laughs> this is a very good question. Zach, are you not tired standing for an hour and a half? <laughs> No, I, I, that's why I have the, the standing desk, you know? <laughs> so we've got a couple of really good questions. And I'd love to see if we can get some answers for some of these really fantastic learners. Let um, me interject with just that. Please. There was one question, uh, right? And Yaks Mandaf uh, asked about sleep. Sleep is super yeah. important. 
but do not read the book Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Uh, <laughs> there are so many errors uh, and Ooh. misrepresentations in that book that it's absolutely shocking. Um, most people on average, it turns out, uh, are healthiest with uh, between six and seven hours of sleep a night, not eight as he mandates. Uh, and so if you're sleeping, you know, shorter, don't stress about it. In fact, a lot of times when people tell you sleep for eight hours, then uh, you lie there for an hour in anxiety because you're not sleeping that hour and so forth. So anyway, yes, sleep is important, but at the same time, uh, you know, try not to be crazy because actually it's like six or seven hours is going to suit most people just fine. There is no drama that I like more than academic drama to be like, yeah, get some sleep, but off that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny. That's the first time I've ever not recommended because everybody, when it first came out, everybody loved that book and they love it still. But actually now people are really looking at it and going, you know, wait a minute, he made that up. <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, yeah. And I, I think that's something that we find with increasing amounts of research in sort of a lot of neuroscience spaces and a lot of um, physical health spaces that when you look back on some of the research, they're just like, oh yeah, I, I put that out. So the 10,000 steps a day number um, is yeah. equally, um, it came from a Japanese pedometer because the symbol for 100,000 looks like a little dude walking. So they're like, oh, let's put that on the package. Yeah, there's the the problem is if you have a charismatic, good-looking person who is saying what you want to hear, you can get away with anything. Especially if you have some kind of um, you know prestigious position at a university. And I could name dozens of names, but my editor would kill me. So I'm not. <laughs> going to do that. We'll have to get you back here, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll dial in live from the pub and be like, "So, Barbara, <gasps> wait, <laughs> What's wait, the gossip." <laughs> <laughs> Let's get a couple more questions in here. We've got Nermi Dev saying, hey, do you, w when is too late to learn to program? I think on your deathbed, that's... That, that would probably, uh, I like how it sounds like a threat as well. Like, well, you believe in yourself or... <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, when I was uh, 60, I uh, I thought, you know, I really want to create this online course. I knew nothing. I could press the button on a video camera. That was all I knew. So I'm going to YouTube and I'm trying to figure out how how do you put together a green screen studio? How do you edit video? I never edited video before. You, you know, so it's, it's like this completely new area for me. And uh, I felt like a total bumbling idiot. But actually it turned out that... Um, because I was uh, not an expert in that area at all, I used approaches like green screen. Normal people, if they know anything about uh, doing video editing, green screen is for advanced practitioners. But I was an idiot. I didn't know anything about it. So I'm like, Were well, you an screen. idiot? Well, you know, green screen sounded pretty good. So I didn't realize that I wasn't supposed to do that stuff, that it was too advanced. And sure enough, it, it was really hard to kind of figure out how to do things. But yeah, you know, I just kind of kept at it, you know, spaced repetition. And so it really is possible, even at older ages, to learn skills that, you know, are you going to become a quantum physicist? you know, at age 85, starting from, you know, uh, no expertise in physics, probably not. But you can do a, mo a lot more than you ever can think you can do. There's a question here that I'd love to hear hear more about. Um, and Felix is asking, hey, do you want, uh, they want if, if you have any insight into um, how dopamine works in our brain in the learning process. And dopamine is one of the reward chemicals, isn't it? It's one like one of the, the ones you're supposed to try and get more of. Oh, I, I have these, like this tremendous visual. So if you can go on to another uh, uh, question for Zach. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we'll <laughs> we'll uh, come back. Apparently, we're going to get something really exciting about dopamine for you. I'm terrified. Okay. I'm thrilled. Yeah. I promise we're going to come back to this. Uh, this might be really, really specific, and I'm kind of hoping the answer to this one is eat cookies and trash, but does anybody have any opinions on a way to manage meals that helps our productivity? Eat 
trashy trash. I, I actually, I, I do. Uh, uh, let me put it. I, you know, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a doctor, whatever. So I'm just going to speak from like what has uh, what has helped me. Um, honestly, I I learned a few years ago about um, insulin spikes and the effect of insulin spikes on making you feel tired and woozy and unfocused. And that persuade you know my understanding when I looked into that persuaded me that I might take seriously. Uh, my diet as a part of, you know, my, my productivity as a person. And so for that reason, like, it's unfortunately uh, the opposite of the, uh, of what you wanted to hear, Jess. It's, you know, avoiding insulin spikes means, especially during your work day, like I don't, I don't uh, eat junk food and more or less I kind of eat low carb. And also I don't eat all that much during the day. I eat more when I'm done, done working for the day. Um, and at least for me, that has helped me feel more kind of even keel throughout the day. And I don't get that, you know, post lunch slumber, you know, and all that. Yeah. So we could just be on different else. sides of this. So I could say, like, hey, yeah. as a professional <laughs> goofball, eat, eating, living like a raccoon and, yeah. and just consistently staying up all night and eating trash is absolutely an option, should that be what, what your heart desires. L lots of coffee and green tea. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's actually, there is good evidence. There is, uh, there's some good research papers that a substance co called coca via, so it's C O, I think it's C O C O V I A, and it's chocolate, um, and it enhances cognitive function. And because uh, they always say chocolate helps with uh, cognitive function, but a lot of times it's stripped out of candy bars and so forth, all the good stuff. So Coca Via is, uh, I take that, I took that this morning. Um, and uh, it, there is some evidence that it, enh it enhances cognition. I, I too try for low carb. <laughs> but I do, I, I'm not yeah, perfect. I do joke about living like a raccoon, but one thing, oh, this sounds very personal to be like, Hi, brilliant experts and the, the wide word of the internet. You know, my number one anxiety is uh, dementia risk. Uh, and I've been experimenting with the mind diet for the, the past year and a half, which is a, a combination of the Mediterranean diet that had been researched in the past five, six years uh, and some adaptations where they're doing some research like, hey, is this neuroprotective? Um, but mostly because I like all the food on it. If it was just like, oh, eat barley every day, I'd be like, nah, it's not worth that. Oh, I'm going to have to look that up because I can joke about Alzheimer's just because my father died of it. And I realize that joking about it is uh, a very good way to handle about it. So the as they say, the good thing of Alzheimer's is that you get to hide your own Easter eggs. Um, <laughs> but I mean, really, my father would, he would joke about, he actually had on his hat, he had, uh, Alzheimer's on, written on the inside. So he'd, he'd go, I have, and it was written Alzheimer's. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I, I actually have some really funny stories that he would have loved for me to share, but, uh, uh I should, we'll, we'll bully you back. We're just going to take up all of your time. So here's this really fantastic question that Felix is like, Oh, hey, oh you know wait, what? no, I'm ready to talk about dopamine. Do I have this? Yeah, yeah, I got okay. you. I got you. We're all uh, cool. Oh, yes. Hey, like a, what about dopamine? Uh, okay. I mean, it's so exciting. <gasps> Dopamine is the feel-good molecule, which is why we try to hijack it with things that we shouldn't be taking. Oh. Um, but uh, it is released in the brain when we have uh, unexpected rewards. So uh, what happens is when you get some little surprising reward, like, hey, you debugged that code. You finally found it. What it does is send out through the brain something, uh, dopamine, through its phasic dopamine. It's these little tiny pulses of dopamine and they go throughout the brain. And here is what they do. Uh, there, well, there's two flavors. As I mentioned, there's, uh, well, there's uh, one of them is tonic and that helps with your motivation. Uh, and it's always kind of around, it's like Muzak in a store. But then there's phasic dopamine, which is when you have unexpected rewards, like solving that, you know, figuring out where that bug was. And it, so you predicted you wouldn't be able to find it because you couldn't find it all before. But then suddenly, wow, you, you found it. This helps with learning. It, and it helps in a very interesting way. When you have dopamine released, it helps it. See, look at the difference. 
it strengthens the neural connections. So what happens, uh, they found out with little mice, you know, these poor little mice as long ago, uh, they would remove or disable their dopamine systems and they couldn't learn anything new. So dopamine is at the heart of learning. And here's how it works. So let's say you're trying to figure out this bug in a code. Now you tried this approach. No, it doesn't work. Then you try another approach. No, it doesn't work. Then you try another approach. No, it doesn't work. Then you try another approach and guess what? It actually, you solved it. When you solve it, that little phasic dopamine goes around burst in a burst and it it's like it sniffs out what that connection was that you just used to help you solve the problem. And this strengthens that connection. And that is how you learn to code. Oh, it worked. Look, it worked. And then it's reinforced and strengthens those very sets of connections. So dopamine is super important in learning. Uh, as far as motivation goes, of course, dopamine is also important there. But that's where uh, unexpected rewards don't help you know, with learning so much. They help with motivation. And what's actually, like if you reframe from, this is the most god-awful boring thing I could possibly think of to do, to, wow, my wife's going to have a baby. And I, if I solve this, I'm going to get kind of kudos at work. And, make, you know, so you reframe it, that helps with this tonic dopamine that, that can help you to be, better motivated. So we're going to, we're going to pickle on this next question because this, this really dovetails into it. And we've got somebody saying, Hey, so I get to give up when I don't know the answer to a problem. Right. And it sounds like from the, the dopamine chain answer, hopefully not. Well, you've got it when you are curious, you, you know, or you really, you want to figure this thing out. You'll never get that burst of dopamine if you don't figure it out. So it, it, that's that, uh, oh, that's it. You don't get the hit if you don't do it. So uh, I, uh, if you like- I love drugs, how we're sounding like brain drug dealers to be like, okay, well don't do mushrooms. And like, well, you're not gonna get that. I, we should reiterate that we, we are actually suggesting that y'all not do drugs, please and thank you. But dopamine uh, is internal, so it's okay. Cool. <laughs> so like, I, I also, you can make I, your I, own. I also would point out that the early phase of learning to code is really punctuated by this experience of the almost like manic joy of when you solve a problem or when the code finally compiles or the bug finally goes away or whatever, it, it, it hits you so, so strongly. Uh, funny enough, I, I found that as time goes on, that's kind of less the case in the sense oh. that because you understand. Uh, you're just more even keel because you understand why something is not broken. And so you don't necessarily get, maybe I should say the dopamine is not as unexpected because you know what the answer is going to be. Right. So, uh, but early on uh, sticking around for that dopamine spike is well worth the, the price of admission. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got so many good questions. I'm conscious that we're not going to get to all of these. I'm so sorry. Y'all. We'll also be discussing some of these questions on the forum. So, so come on in and have a chat about that if you like. Um, and we've got uh, Caddy saying like, hey, we've talked about a bunch of different ways to learn. Is reading sort of outdated then? Is this is this less effective? Oh, no. Because remember that part where I said um, direct instruction involves explicit explanation and active practice. That explicit uh, explanation or instruction can come from a book. It can come from a teacher talking with you. Um, you know, uh, so uh, it can come from a video, it can come from many sources. For me personally, reading is my thing. I re try to read a book a week, and I think it really has enhanced my entire life by doing that. I am terrified and impressed, and I better understand how you went from that, that adorable child holding a lamb into wonderful and, and terrifying and imposing and glorious. Um, if it's not strange to single someone out, can we yell at Adrian together lovingly? Um, Adrian's got a social work background. It's like, hey, do you all know anybody from the social sciences that transitioned into a tech career? Hmm. 
Um, and yes, so many. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go first. Like, oh, you know, I, I know this lady who, and yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't have to look very far. I mean, I studied economics and philosophy in university. And like, so you could argue that my career was in the social sciences in that sense. Like that, that's what I studied and what I enjoyed and what I was into. And um, now I work in tech. So uh, there's no reason to think that you can't make that transition. And honestly, um, I would argue that, you know, it might depend on the social science and maybe it depends what you're into, but um, bringing in stuff from social science into your understanding of software engineering and the way in which you understand the human element is really powerful. The, the reality is, is that oftentimes the most effective and highest ranked engineers on the team are not necessarily the most like technically rigorous. They're not the person necessarily you would say is the, the best framework expert or whatever, because there's a degree to which being effective as an engineer is, yes, it is in large part about that technical expertise, but it is also in realizing like, this is the thing that moves the needle for the business. This is what matters. None of this matters. Like you avoid maybe navel gazing in some on some code thing that doesn't really move the needle because you recognize the reality of opportunity cost from economics or whatever it happens to be. So I would not be discouraged at all if you have a social sciences background. There's there's a lot there that can help you as long as you get that good technical core, of course. So, so I wrote a book about uh, people retraining into dramatically different uh, areas, and it features Zach. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, of course, I'd known Zach before then, but he's a perfect example. But this book also profiles a woman who was um, in the social sciences. She worked in HR, and uh, she got a bad boss. So she thought she was going to spend the whole rest of her career just working there. And that was not to be because sometimes you have to make a decision, um, you know, and so she was kind of, she, she decided she couldn't take it anymore. So she went and trained, retrained to become um, a software, uh, you know, a programmer. And, and what she found is she's like the most popular programmer uh, in her whole group, because she can actually, she knows how to easily communicate the ideas of what she's doing, what she's working with. And so she's like, so happy with this whole, what unfolded. And you can read that story in, in the book, Mind Shift. I'll go ahead and link to that for folks. Thank you so much. Oh, and we've got folks in the chat. So Sammy says, hey, I'm a lawyer and I'm transitioning. Who who else said this? Someone else was like, oh, me too. Oh, and look, Noah's saying, I'm in the social sciences as well. Let's let's switch together. Everything's fine. Everything's going to be fine. Membe's got such a good question. How about we take this one and one more question, and then I will lovingly push y'all back out into the world. And then they ask, hey, you know, how can I practice regular coding without breaks along the week? Like, is there sort of an approach or is there some kind of recommendations y'all might have for I'm a busy person with a busy week? How do I get those regular practice sessions in? Zach, do you want to handle this one? Sure. Um, so like was discussed in the presentation, especially when you're first learning, the idea that you're going to be sitting at home and writing code intensely for 10 hours every day, you know, for weeks on end, it's just not, it's not realistic. And I actually would say, I see, I've seen a lot of questions here about burnout that I have seen some uh, developers and I have done this myself where uh, you get so inspired when you're first learning or you're first taking on this challenge that you're like, this is all I'm going to do. And you, you put in these like sort of ridiculous hours and the problem is that you burn yourself out and it's not a sustainable pace. And of course, without that sustainable pace, you don't end up with all the benefit of accumulating those neural connections through the, the way that that practice has been spaced out. So how can I practice regular coding without breaks along the week? I would say the first thing is the idea of doing it without breaks is, is not a great idea because you need breaks that, for the reasons that Barb described in, in the presentation. If we're talking about how do you practice regular coding, um, my opinion is that, uh, again, my opinion is that starting by programming first thing in the morning, doing your most high focus task first thing in the morning, to me, at least that helps a lot and other people have expressed some success with this. So 
truly at this stage in your learning, getting up and doing one hour, you know, let's say roughly three, four Pomodoros or something of truly, totally focused programming where you're, you're going to be debugging or building something um, that I really think will get you that that will take you a long way. It's not going to burn you out, but it's going to get you thinking about something every day. And the rest of the rest of the day, your mind gets to mull over whatever problem you left off on in the morning. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if you're looking for any kind of a, a deeper formula, but honestly, it's just like do a reasonable amount of time regularly every day. <laughs> and uh, and that really is the only formula I know. There's kind of no cheating the, the system as far as I'm concerned. I think that dovetails. So this will be our last question. I'm so sorry, y'all. Um, both of you are welcome if you want to come hang out in the forum, but no pressure. You're, you're very, very busy. But for, for our classmates and for those of us who are just joining us who want to go ahead and join the boot camp, we just did our first lessons this week. You're not behind at all. Come and learn to program with us. We'd be so excited. But we'll go ahead and carry on this conversation in the forum just to make sure that folks get to, to have their say. But you mentioned burnout. Hey, how should I deal with burnout? And and I'm super happy to to be involved in this as well, just because I love being lovingly mean to people about how should they should rest more. Just as aggressive, we're like, take care of yourself or else. Okay, I I think Zach really is uh, the master, and and you you both really can handle this question. Uh, um, for me, the biggest thing on burnout is I I just set a time at the end of the day where I it's it's tune out time. And I, I am, I try to be very religious about, you know, I have a space and a time and it's like, thank you, but no, thank you. I'm not going to do that talk for you because it's in Kazakhstan and I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak after six o'clock or four o'clock or whatever time I set that day. So um, that's my big thing to avoid. I know daily I've got a, a a limit. There's a wonderful book actually on, on this point uh, that touches on a lot of things we talked about by a computer science professor named Cal Newport called Deep Work. And um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of his ideas there. And one of the things he describes is that when you get really good at having that tune out time and using your time wisely and really focusing in, you find that your life can feel a bit less hectic and even more leisurely because your, your output is powerful enough and you know intense enough in the time because you're so focused that stopping at 4 p.m stopping at 6 p.m it doesn't feel like oh i'm falling behind i'm not learning whatever because you've been able to get a good you know honest day's work in the time allotted uh, and especially for something cognitively intense like a profession like engineering it's really important because burnout burnout is real and i would argue that most people quit their development jobs because the companies burn them out <laughs> so it's it's a real thing a better thing um to avoid. Well, one comment, though, is that sometimes you will find yourself in a situation where you just have to push, for, sometimes for months at a time. At, for example, my my older daughter is a physician, so she's going through medical school. Oh, God. You, it's like a fire hose of information nonstop. So what she would do is she would live for that one hour every Friday night of Walking Dead. You know, and just if you have one little thing that you really enjoy, that you can focus on, that you're building on. So during these these occasional periods in your life where you're retraining and learning something new and you really have to do this kind of thing, try to pick one little reward that that you can have to look forward to. If I could, so I'm, I'm going to give a weird one because I'm very different here because you... Um, this internationally renowned computer scientist who's just at the at the top of your game and a yeah best selling author and a, and a neuroscientist and I'm effectively a human house cat. Um, one thing I really like to suggest, especially to learners and especially getting into computer science, is learning is hard. And then getting your first job in, in tech. A lot of times we all talk about, oh, the unemployment rate's so low or, oh, salaries are so high. And we neglect to say, oh, by the way, getting that first break is really hard. And when I say, that's hard, that's hard. Um, but once you've gotten into your career a little bit, salaries come up generally. 
Um, and the best thing I ever did for myself to, to cut down on burnout is work less. Um, the absolute life-changing joy of three-day weekends or I don't live like a proper person. This is disgusting. Y'all can hate me for this. Four-day weekends, uh, you don't get to write well-lauded books and you don't get to build beautiful websites as often, but you get real good sleep. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think having having true R and R, you know, every so often is is definitely important. You know, the, for instance, the company that I work for, we have a period called cool down at the end of uh, six week sprints. The sprints are very intense, and then we we work more lightly. And oftentimes, people will take a day or two off in the two weeks that follow while you're doing uh, lighter lighter work. And it, it is a way of um, of uh, allowing yourself to recover. But I, you know, I view it as kind of similar to the focused and diffuse modes. It's like yeah. you have to do, you have to go and be intense in the process of actually taking on the thing, and then you earn the the reward of the, <laughs> the three day weekend or or whatever. But I find, especially early on, where you're likely to fall off the learning curve, I would err a bit more on the side of intensity than I would on the, the three day weekend, just because you're trying to get up that hill and it's so hard in the beginning and it's so easy to get. Um, Can we compromise and be like, hey, if you're a learner, only take a couple three day weekends? Sure, why not? Because <laughs> like they're, they, they've got to deal with me every week. I'm going to be a lot more scary week to week than you are. Um, you all have been absolutely fantastic guests. We've gone ahead and shared where people can find you online. Um, and thank you so much. Are there any parting words? Any sort of, hey, y'all, if you only remember one thing, it's this. Retrieval practice. Retrieval practice. <laughs> yeah, I, and I would say uh, stick with it. The truly, the, the early part in getting that first job, it's a tough slog, like Jess said. But truly overnight, once you get that first job, a lot of doors suddenly open. In fact, I like to joke with people, and actually, this isn't a joke, this really happened. The day that I changed my LinkedIn profile from, like, I'm looking for work as a junior developer to I have a job, suddenly my inbox was full of recruiters, even though I was the same person I was the day before. But by getting that first job, you just really de-risk yourself. So it's worth it. It's hard, you, but you can totally do it. And uh, hopefully we'll get to see all of you all again on uh, further down your journey as a programmer. Fab. Barb, thank you so much. And Zach, thank you again uh, for the rest of you. And oh, of course, all of you, thank you so much for making time. Thank you for your fantastic questions. If you come back and join us next week at check the events page, just to be sure. I, I'm not going to do this in all y'all's time zones. Uh, but we're going to be having uh, Bruce Lawson, who's an HTML5 expert, who literally wrote the book on HTML5. Um, and he's going to be talking to us about sort of the philosophy behind the web. That's going to be next Wednesday, the 1st of September. Don't forget that we've got your lesson live streams on Monday and Tuesday. Thank you all so much. And I hope you have the easiest possible afternoon or morning or for at least two of you, the middle of the night. Thank you so much again.